Finding fossil evidence of arthropods before the Cambrian explosion would be a big deal. And one paper from 2018 seems to show that. So I'm going to show you today why I'm skeptical of this and show you just how tricky geology can sometimes be. Hello again. I wasn't expecting to be making this video. In fact, I'm working towards one on the Cambrian explosion, summarising our current state of knowledge and giving everyone a good baseline for what we know and what we don't know. But this paper was getting in the way. So it was actually mentioned and brought up in the comments of the previous um, video. And so thank you for putting me onto this and reminding me about it, because I had forgotten about this paper. I remember it when it first came out, in hindsight, but yeah, it has slipped my mind a bit. So what this paper claims to show, uh, from 2018 by Chen et al, is that they have, from the Shibantan member of the Dunying formation, so same formation as we were looking at in the last video, uh, in the late Ediacaran of China, trackways, which also seem to be continuous with burrows, which is a bit odd, but we'll come back to that, um, made by something with legs. And it looks a little like possibly lobopodian, so things like the modern velvet worms are very derived members of the same group, but there are lots of lobopodians in the Cambrian, and maybe it was something like that. Something with little stubby soft legs that was crawling over these algal mats and leaving behind a trackway. And this has been published in Science Advances, quite a major journal, and it is now, I think, widely accepted, at least in some areas, as being reasonably good evidence that there were arthropods at this time. This is quite a big thing because we have no fossils of arthropods, no body fossils at this time. So let's have a good look at this paper because I really don't think it stands up to scrutiny. At first glance, it's good. You can see straight away that these are trace fossils and these burrows are very well known from the Shibantan member. So this is not new in that sense. And these are something like a centimetre wide, they're quite substantial structures, they're irregularly cylindrical, they may have been going slightly underneath the mats, meandering through the sediment, and they seem to be genuinely burrows. I've got no problem with that. I do have a problem with saying they are definitely animals, because there is another alternative uh, in the form of Lysarian protists, which, again, another video in future on that one, but there are protists that can make trails a little like this, of the same scale, even living up today. So going back to the Ediacaran, it's entirely possible that there were large protists that were producing similar burrows. We cannot rule that out, and therefore we cannot say just from the burrows themselves that they are animals. And the authors are... I don't think they were claiming that, but anyway. What they're claiming in this one is the trackways crossing over these burrows, leaving little sort of footprints um, as, they, uh, as they pass over them, and therefore they are separate structures and it was made by something with legs. That is the basic argument. And there's, they go into detail in terms of um, the cross-cutting relationships of the, the various burrows and trackways, and they also go into a lot more detail in terms of the uh, looking at the footprint array and so on, trying to work out something about the sort of uh, the thing that created it. They do say, however, in the paper that these the, the array of footprints is very irregular compared with modern um, equivalents or Phanerozoic later fossil records. So that's a peculiar thing. Um, not necessarily a problem, but you can imagine anything making an irregular array of footprints would be stumbling a little bit. Uh, maybe it didn't matter back then, but you know, it, it's something to bear in mind. But what we really want to know is, are these definitely footprints at all? Is there something else potentially going on? And I think the evidence is actually there in their own images. So if we look at this image in particular, you have a trackway that they say, and 
and it quite clearly does, turn into a burrow. So in this part, at the top, it is a burrow-like structure. It seems to be a, a, a cylindrical sleeve. Um, so that is something that is going into sediment and is surrounded by it. And in the lower part, it is a series of traces of footprints. The authors are arguing that this is walking along on top of the mat and then burrowed underneath the mat, so more or less on the same level. And that might work, but yeah, let's, let's let that one pass. And look at exactly what these structures are made of, because that's the critical thing. This burrow area, you can see, is covered by a little sort of crust of dark material covering the surface. It's dark and it's rubbly. There was no elemental mapping performed for this paper. We don't know what these materials are, what they're made of. But it is some sort of mineral effect which is forming a crust over the surface of this burrow. You can see it very clearly around the edges. You can see it's got irregular fractures. It's, it, it's lumpy. It's not a, a smooth sheet. But there appears to have been a mineralization effect around the edge of this burrow, and that's what's defining it. That's actually not at all surprising, because many burrows, or burrows in general, alter the chemistry of the surrounding sediment. So they bring oxygen into an area without oxygen, for example. They allow the flow of water along a conduit which would otherwise be stagnant. And so you very commonly end up with crystal growths, pyrite, all sorts of things can happen depending on the, the environmental chemistry. And you end up with little sort of crusts or rinds forming around burrows. This is not unexpected at all to see that. The problem is that if you have a slightly sinuous burrow moving through the sediment, going up and down through the surface, and then you go from a surface view of that burrow, so you're seeing that edge of it, and then it moves slightly vertically, and you're then seeing a cross-section through the walls of that burrow, and it's a slightly rubbly growth of minerals around it, then what you end up with looks remarkably like a trackway. The authors do provide a lot of interesting views, alternative angles, different lighting effects and so on of these structures, which is really good. And, and you can even see at the end of the trackway it closes into a loop, which makes perfect sense for um, crystals around the edge of a burrow, which is now going into the sediment, but makes no sense at all for a trackway. And then they try to interpret where you have repeated patterns of footprints, maybe, where there are scratch marks. They do say in the description that they're not certain that some of these structures that they're seeing are real, which is perfectly reasonable. You're perfectly entitled to point out things that you think might be important, but you can't be certain that they are actually genuinely there and not random artifacts. And because you never know, if you get more material in future, you can then compare whether the same patterns repeat, and that becomes useful data. But a lot of these figures that they show it's very much trying to find patterns and not really succeeding. I mean, they say how irregular this array of footprints is. They even illustrate a modern example, more modern example, a Phanerozoic fossil, which is from the Devonian, a nice Devonian trackway, which shows how you get the feet tending to be very discreet, of similar size, and clustered in fairly neat little bundles where you have regular waves of, um, of footprints. And they also say that the size of their footprints is also very variable, which they put down to secondary diagenetic effects, so crystal growths after the rock has been deposited. And this is definitely a thing that can happen. Um, the problem is that if you're getting crystal growth um, going on, then you have to allow for that crystal growth to be happening, potentially even without there being footprints at all. So we have a fossil. I agree it is burrowed. No problem with that. Then you have this issue of, are the footprints real? 
The fossil itself is a partial counterpart, and on the one part you see depressions, as you would with footprints. The other, you have little spikes and projections sticking out, which is the counterpart. That's okay if it's just sediment filling those spaces. If there are crystals filling those spaces, that's a really big problem, because you don't know whether the crystals grew randomly or filled in a pre-existing space. And in this case, where we have a burrow that clearly has mineralization around the margin, that's, that, that's just unavoidable. It's, it's there, you can see it. And then it seems to be the same material, which doesn't, from the photos, look to be just pure sediment. It appears to be crystalline in some way, and the same material as is forming this crust around the burrow. At that point, you have no reason to think that those structures are anything other than crystals, which are which are grown within the sediment, in the margin of the burrow, are projecting outwards from the, where they grew, and the impressions of those crystals are what is giving you the footprints. That would explain why there is so much irregularity in the size of the footprints, why there is no regularity in the arrangement of them, and it is the only thing that really makes sense. Because if you were to have even an Ediacaran lobopod, it would still be a lobopod. It would still have evolved, it would have segmentation and muscle structure, coordination of the limbs, and so on. And you would expect to see much more regularity in the structures than really exists. And with the Eye of Faith, you can sort of see that some of these, you know, two or three at a time, are lined up kind of in oblique lines. The problem is, as the authors say, they're not sure that's real, and I'm not sure that's real either. I don't think it is. I think when you have an array of little um, crystals more or less along a smooth margin, then you're going to get little lines of two or three or four just by chance. And I think that we have to assume that that's what's going on here. What this boils down to is an argument over the level of evidence required. So in this case, I think the actual balance of evidence is in favour of this not being footprints at all. It doesn't look like footprints to me. It doesn't look regular enough. And, it, and there is, in the images, an alternative explanation which makes much more sense as a purely chemical artifact, just a crystallographic um, growth texture. But the question then is, do we take this as the only real evidence for arthropods, things with legs, in the Ediacaran, as something probably close to 10 million years below the boundary, so quite a long way back? This is the only example that we've got, as far as I'm aware. And if you had Lobopodians wandering around on these mats, you would think that they would be abundant. These um, algal uh, microbial mats retain really nice impressions. They're like really good sticky mud. That's why we have such a good Ediacaran fossil record. If there were Lobopodians or arthropods with crunchy legs or anything actually definitely animal wandering around on these surfaces, Surely we should see large numbers of these traces. If I'd found this in the Silurian or the Devonian, I'd probably go, ooh, that's cool, and not worry about it too much. But in this case, we have to worry about it, because this has major implications for our understanding of when animals evolved and diversified, potentially. So we have to be thorough. We have to not just accept something because it looks good at first glance. And at the very least, before I went near to accepting this, and I don't think that is going to happen simply because the evidence that I can see actually points in the opposite direction, but at the very least I would want to see a, an elemental map of the specimen showing that there is no mineral growth in the um, forming these novels that then give the impressions of footprints, showing that there isn't a crust of minerals growing over the surface of these burrows. You might also ask why you would only get that in just one or two burrows and then it just fades out rapidly. Um, and that is just a function of the local chemistry, uh, exact proportions of oxygen in the sea floor, for example, where the mat is decaying a bit faster than somewhere else. Um, that's not a problem at all.
Now you do get small scale variations in chemistry all over the place when you start looking at fossils seriously. Uh, and I think the cross-cutting relationships that we see are also perfectly reasonable in that you see a reduction in the intensity of these crystal growths as the two um, burrows uh, cross each other and that will have disturbed things but you've still got chemical relics of the um, where the burrows are overlapping each other in three dimensions you might have um, chemical residues leading to renewed crystallization after one has cut across leading to regrowth to a small extent in the area where it had been disturbed it would be very difficult to work out exactly what the relationships were between the mineral growths because we don't know at what stage during the diagenesis it even happened but there is nothing there that i can see that looks like it could cause any problem for that interpretation. Okay, this was only a relatively short video. I just wanted to try to put across a detailed exposition of why we have to be careful. Because geology is tricky. It does all sorts of weird little things with crystals, with chemical microenvironments that you don't normally think about. We can't just look at something that looks like a trackway superficially and just accept it immediately. Don't treat this as a, as a rejection of all Precambrian trace fossils or anything of that nature. This is an example of the sort of process we really have to go through to get any sort of certainty. When you're looking at the oldest evidence for bilaterial animals, that's something you have to pay very close attention to. We have to be thorough and and many times it seems that some of these papers could have had a bit more scrutiny. Anyway, I'll leave it there. See what you think. I'm not saying that I have all the answers. I'm not. I'm no guru on Precambrian trace fossils. But from my experience of working in Paleozoic rocks and looking at body fossils, trace fossils, mineralogical effects, all the rest of it, this is my take on what I'm seeing here. Others may agree, they may disagree, but as far as I can make out, this is not evidence for Lobopodians in the Ediacaran. Sorry. That'll do for this one. I'm going to be tied up for a couple of days because I have an appointment with an electron microscope. Um, but hopefully I'll have a Cambrian explosion extravaganza for you um, sometime around the weekend, I think. And um, have a lovely Thanksgiving to all those in America. And I'll see you again fairly shortly.